Hey, thank you so much for choosing to spend some time with us. Our hope is that every message here at Life Church allows you to get to know the real Jesus even more than you did before. We hope you'll be able to join us at one of our many campuses or online every single week. Just jump on livelife.church to find the campus nearest you. If this message has impacted you, we encourage you to click on the Give tab and partner with us through giving and seeing what God can do through Life Church. We're going to kick off at the movies with our, how many saw The Lion King? How many's ever seen The Lion King? So let me just give you a synopsis. The Lion King is about who is the true king uh, of, the, of a place called Pride Land. And uh, the, the battle is, is Scar versus Simba, okay? And so it reminds me of a game I grew up playing as a kid. How many remember this game right here? How many remember that game? Checkers. Checkers. And so we know in checkers, nobody plays that anymore. Uh, you got too much digital stuff going on. But anyway, checkers was all about trying to conquer the board and getting all the, capturing all of your opponent's uh, pieces. But, but what would you say when you were able to get your checker all the way to the opponent's far side, what would you say? King, King me. That's my subtitle, King Me. We live in a world, guys, where everybody is screaming, King Me. We want to be king. Uh, many are saying, King Me. You might not use those words, but in the home, at work, in your relationships. What do I mean by that? Everybody wants to have the top spot, if you will, or who's in charge, or who has the power our counselors will tell you most of the couples that come to them for counseling, it's who's in charge? Who's going to have the last say? What are they doing? King me. Now, here's what I've discovered. If you, if I, if we king ourselves, here's what we'll always deal with. We'll always deal with insecurity, competition, and stress. Why is that? Because if you king you, you will always be concerned about who's trying to keep you off the throne or who's trying to take your throne. And it leads to insecurity. It leads to stress. But when we just focus on loving and serving God and not who's in charge, he brings the promotion. I want you to understand in this message, this is not about that God doesn't want to elevate us or promote us. That is not true at all. But if we'll allow God to do it, if we'll let God bring us to that next level in life, and we're not screaming, King me, you and I will have much less stress. And we won't be dealing with all this insecurity and, and competition the most famous king in the Bible, Pastor Jason had talked to you a few minutes ago that we're going to study the life of David in our men's movement. But if you look at the life of David, he demonstrated what I want to talk to you about more than anybody else besides Jesus. Let's talk about David. He was caught between two men who were screaming, King me. And those men were Saul and Absalom. Now, let's talk about him real quickly. Saul, we know, was the first king of Israel. Saul started, started out right. Uh, Saul, when, when Samuel went to anoint the next king of Israel, um, he finds Saul, and when he first approaches Saul and says, God has anointed you, he's going to anoint you to be the king of Israel, Saul says, who am I? I'm nobody important. Why would you choose me? And so Samuel went ahead and anointed him. He became king. But what happened was Saul got caught up in pride. And he started thinking more of himself than he ought. And then Samuel finally, God spoke to Samuel and said, I want you to, I'm, I'm replacing Saul. I'm taking my anointing off of Saul to be king. And I'm choosing someone else. And we know that's when Samuel went to anoint David. But when Samuel went to Saul, he tells him, he says, when you were small in your own eyes, God made you king. What was he saying? You've gotten caught up in pride. Then David is anointed to be king. Several years later, he is put on the throne. He's king. But then comes Absalom, which is David's own son. And Absalom 
was screaming, what? King me. David doesn't need to be king. I need to be king. And if you go back to Saul a minute, uh, Saul was trying to kill David because he discovered that the anointing was on David to be king and not him anymore. So what was Saul's, uh, what did he attempt to do? He was always trying to kill David. He would throw spears at David. And one time we know that Saul was in a vulnerable position. Matter of fact, the Bible says they were searching for David and he went to a cave to relieve himself. Do I need to describe what that's about? Okay. <laughs> he went to pee pee. Okay. Uh, and David had the opportunity to kill him. And his advisors were saying, take him out. He's vulnerable. Take him out. And here's what David said. David said, how be it for me to touch God's anointed? Hey, man, this guy's trying to kill him. We're going to get to this point. He said, I'm not doing it. I'm not taking. And he said, and the, the advisors were saying, you know you're anointed to be king. It's your rightful place. Take him out. And David said, I'm not doing it. Then later on, David becomes king. And Absalom comes, and he's trying to manipulate his way in. He's trying to influence people. And so the same advisors said, take him out. You're king. You have the power. Take Absalom out. Same, same advisors. You know what David said? Not doing it. Here, here, here's the thing. Saul was so focused on, I want to cling to be king uh, Absalom was trying to manipul manipulate to bring himself to be king. Here's David's heart. Here's the point of this. David's heart was, I'm not going to try to bring the throne, nor will I cling to the throne. Here's what David was saying. God's my promoter. If God wants me on the throne, he'll put me on the throne. If God wants me off the throne, he'll take me off the throne. You can go read it. Saul and Absalom did not end up very well. Why? Because they were into self-promotion. King me, king me. See, instead of fighting for position, God is calling us to a life of submission. And submission is not a bad word. You're going to discover in this message that it's the way God promotes us. Let me show you this, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20. Ephesians 5, 20. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is, notice this, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. You know what that tells me? If you and I really fear the Lord, and that's not like being afraid of, it's having a reverence for God, we will submit to one another. But here's what's interesting. So he says in Ephesians 5.20, submit to one another in the fear of the Lord. And then if you go and read this whole chapter, we're going to take time, he goes into the marriage relationship. And he starts, starts talking about husbands and wives. Then he goes over into chapter 6 and starts talking about parents and children. Then he starts talking about employees and employers. You know what he's saying? He's saying if you really want to experience promotion in life, you're going to get a hold of this submitting thing. See, there are authorities in every one of those. In the marriage, in parents and children, and in employer employee. employee. But he says, submit yourselves one to another. Quit screaming, king me all the time. Promotion, here's what... The, the, the Holy Spirit through the writer is saying, promotion comes from devotion. Submission is how we tr find true position in life. Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Let me show you this. He or she who is faithful in what is least is also faithful in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is also in much. In verse 12, two verses down, it says this. And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? Did you know this is true in every area of life? A great example of this is a friend of mine who today, he's probably got, in, in his business, uh, he's got one of the largest companies in this certain industry. It's all over the southeast. But he started out working for a guy in this same industry. And I remember him telling me one time, he said, I've just always, my grandfather raised me to have a good work ethic. And I always knew that whoever hired me, uh, if I don't give them a good day's work, I'm stealing. Wow, boy, if that would come back today. Yeah. It's the truth. And uh, he said, 
I can remember on certain jobs. Now, this is crazy, and he wasn't married, <laughs> girls, so hang on. But he said, I can remember on certain jobs that I would sleep in my truck. Wouldn't even go home. So I could be the last one on the job, and so I could also be the first one on the job. He said, I wanted to be that man's best employee. I wonder if that's maybe a secret of why he's where he's at today. You see, this works in every area of life. And I've been in ministry for 22 years. And I've seen what we're talking about done right, and I've seen it done wrong. There's a friend of mine who is a pastor, and we will call each other, and he'll ask me. I've been doing this a little longer than him, so he'll call and ask me some questions. And, and he's helped me as much as I help him. But when I got to know him, I discovered that he had served his senior pastor for 20 years. 20 years. And then when, his lead, when the lead pastor left, he took over the church. Did you know that church is exploding and experiencing tremendous growth? You know why I believe it is? Because of what we're talking about right now. He served him faithfully. If you're faithful over another man's, the Bible says God will give you your own I believe this is one of the main reasons that I have found God's favor in ministry. What do I mean by that? I, listen, I've done a lot of things wrong. But one thing I can say is when I went into ministry, I served my senior pastor until the day he left for his next position. Now, I know God will call people out. Absolutely. And we are not, we are not like that. If, if one of my staff says, I feel like God's calling me, man, I'm going to tell you something. I bless them. I encourage them because I want people to follow God. But it's how you leave. It's how you leave. Okay? But I believe one of the main reasons that I've experienced favor is I can look back and say, I served my pastor until he was promoted to his next place of ministry. Let me show you another guy in the Bible that did that very thing. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with, now get a hold of this, 12 Yoke of oxen. That's, we're going to come back to that. And he himself was driving the twelfth pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Now, what's that about? He threw his cloak on him and just walked off. What he was saying is, God's calling you to follow me, is what he's saying. Now, watch this. He said, let me kiss my father and mother goodbye. He said, and then I will come, come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elijah left him and went back. He took his 12 yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. Now, I want you to understand something about this 12 yoke of oxen. Elijah, Elisha was very successful. See, back in this day, if you had one ox, a lot of people didn't have any. If you had one, you could work your ground and take care of your family, Okay? This Elisha had 12 yoke of oxen. In our day, he's a very successful entrepreneur. He's not just raising crops for himself, but he's a businessman. Okay? The thing is, he, what did he do with his... Sometimes we want to, well, I'll follow God, but I want to make sure I hang on to this. What did he do with his 12 yoke of oxen? He slaughtered them, and he burnt all the equipment. Well, you know what he's saying? I'm going to follow you all the way. I'm burning. I'm, I'm getting rid of my business. There's nothing to go back to. I guess if I could title this story, I would title it, Leave, Cleave, and Receive. Ooh, don't you like that? <laughs> Notice this, 2 Kings 3.11. What did he go to? We know he left a very successful life, but what did Elisha go to? Here it is, 2 Kings 3.11. But Jehoshaphat asked, Is there no prophet of the Lord here? Through whom we may inquire of the Lord. An officer of the king of Israel answered, Elisha, son of Saphat, is here. Notice this. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. Do you see that? Do you know what his job was? He leaves a successful life. And what is his job? To pour water on Elijah's hands. He became Elijah's water boy. Has he stepped down or what? Well, let's, let's continue the story. 2 Kings 2, 1. 
when the Lord was about to take Elijah up into heaven to a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Shut up. (laughs) Notice this. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So this is the second time Elijah said, just stay here. Just stay here. And Elijah, Elisha both times said, no, no, no. Wherever you go, I'm going. I'm submitted to you. Notice this. So they went down to Jericho. The company of prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, he replied. So be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Jordan. <laughs> For some reason, he's trying to get rid of this guy. What's he doing? He's testing him. How committed are you? How committed and how submitted are you to me? Notice this. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty men from the company of prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. He's a bad boy, ain't he? He doesn't split the hollow, praise the Lord. Notice this. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what can I do for you before I am taken from you. Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elisha replied, you have asked a difficult thing, Elisha said. Elijah said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not. As they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and the horses of, the fire, of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And boy, that's a way to go out. Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took hold of his garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak and... Cloak, And it fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left and he crossed over. The company of prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. You know what this teaches us? Those who honor through submission, will give, be given a position of honor. Those who honor through submission. He could have any time go, I'm not pouring water on your hands. Are you kidding me? How many, how many think now he's probably glad he did that? Amen. The same anointing was upon him. Matter of fact, I'll put it this way. We see here that Elisha parted the waters just like Elijah Listen, but before he parted water, he poured water. A lot of people want to part water. A lot of young guys coming in ministry, they want to part water, but they don't want to pour water for nobody. See, here's what's crazy. Elijah performed more miracles than anybody in the Old Testament except Elisha. He, he did twice as many miracles. Why? Faithfulness. He gained position through submission. You see, foundations are important, folks. Foundations are important. My pastor used to tell me this. Remember this. How you leave is how you enter. How you leave. What was my pastor saying? How you leave the position you're in now will determine how you enter into your next position. I've seen, again, I've seen it done right, and I've seen it done wrong. In business and in ministry. Uh, I've seen employees that work for a guy, and I've seen assistant pastors, pastors go from serving to deserving. It's my time. And if it's not their time, what they end up doing is end up manipulating, and they end up, can we just keep it real? They end up, instead of working for their boss, they start working against their boss. Can I tell you something? God never honors that. 
God never honors that. Why? Because God works on the honor system. I'll give you a good Bible study to go. Go through the scriptures and underline how many times the, the word honor is used. It'll blow your mind. God operates on the honor system. And when a person goes from serving to deserving and trying to gain a position on themselves, king me, king me, the, the problem is um, they never do receive and achieve the anointing that they could have had. Uh, let me show you this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. I'm sorry, 17. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Listen to what it says here. Honor all people. How many, how many does that include? Everybody. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. See, honor, honor is like a um, very misunderstood word. When, when Peter here says honor the, all people, and then he says honor the king, do you know this king was very evil? Matter of fact, this is the king that murdered Peter, had him crucified. But he said, honor the king. But what he, he said, honor the king. He didn't say respect the king. There's honor and respect are two different things. See, I may not respect what somebody's doing, but the Bible still tells me to honor all people. We're, how many knows we're called to love the unlovable? That's why our church has grown. We're to... But we're also to honor all people. Now, bosses, let me talk to you a minute. You that are employers, honor all people. We should honor up. We should honor down, which means those that report to us. And we should honor sideways. Honor all people. I see a lot of employers also not honor their employees. I see a lot of employees not honor their bosses, but I see, here's what I, here's, here's what I tell people when they ask me about leadership and things like this, and we start talking about uh, being a boss at the church. Here's what I tell people. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Be the boss that you would want to work for. I'm amazed at how many bosses are just jerks. And the thing is, I look at them and say, you wouldn't work for you. What is that? They don't honor their employees. Listen, God is big on honor. He's huge on it. Romans 13, 7. Romans 13, 7. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Everybody say hallelujah. <laughs> uh, anyway, custom to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. So he says, listen, render honor to one another. See, Jesus and Paul both said this, that in the last days, in the last days, that lawlessness and no honor for authority would abound. In the last days, honor, I wonder if we're in the last days. How many have seen this video right here? Let me show that video, guys. How many have seen this? were making an arrest when a bunch of young men started dousing them with water. Then someone launched the red bucket, hitting the officer. Oh! The humiliation was intense, but the cops carried on doing their job. Oh my God! That's not all. Another video in Brooklyn shows two cops getting drenched. Oh, they not stop it! Oh my God! Look what they do to this police officer. They walk away without so much as flinching as they are mercilessly mocked. I wouldn't draw that Google if I was y'all. Here's the thing, though. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. What is it? We're in the last days, folks. Talk to the school teachers. When I went to school, if I got in trouble, mama was waiting for me at the door. Today, today, and it's not, thank God for our Upper Cumberland area, but today, often the teacher gets in trouble. Why? We're teaching our kids not to honor. God's big on this stuff, man. Listen, here's the problem. When the spirit of dishonor increases, here's what happens. Selfish ambition and ungodly competition begin to manifest. When, when dishonor increases, what does that lead to? It leads to manipulation. Now, hold, hang with me a minute. Manipulation, here's what manipulation is. It's simply self-promotion. What is it? King me. No matter what it takes, I want to be king. 
Manipulation. Here's why this is so important. We need to understand something. We'll say, well, you know, aunt so-and-so or uncle so-and-so. or They're just different. They like to manipulate people. I don't think we understand manipulation will open you up to the demonic more than anything else. I got scripture for it. Manipulation. What is it? It's trying to control people. See, here's why it opens you up to the demonic. Because God himself created us with a free will and God himself won't control you. He'll say, I set before you life and death. But God allows us a free will. So when other human beings try to start manipulating other human beings, we're operating under a law that God doesn't mean. You know the only person who tries to manipulate and control in the spirit world? Satan. Satan. This manipulation thing is scary. That's why D.C. is so... Anyway, let's keep going. It's the truth. It's the truth. James 3, verse 13. Let me show you this. James 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from Above. Selfish ambition does not descend from above. King me does not descend from above. Where does it come from? It is earthly, sensual. Everybody say demonic. 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 Selfish. And amb- Listen, there's nothing wrong with ambition. There's nothing wrong with trying to go and get a promotion. Nothing wrong with that. But it, he said selfish ambition. Manipulation is demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, now get a hold of this phrase, every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is at first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. Let me read to you in the message translation. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It is animal, cunning, devilish, conniving. Whenever you are trying to look better than others or get the, be- get the better of others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at each other's throat. Real wisdom, God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. It is gentle. And reasonable, overflowing with mercy and blessings, not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoys results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. God's big on this. So, we're about to close, but listen. What is the root? I want to ask you a question. What is the root motivation for manipulation? What is the root motivation for, here it is, to gain power and control? Is that not the root to all sin? The first sin was not in the garden. The first sin was in the heavenlies. It, listen, manipulation is what turned Lucifer into Satan. He wanted to gain power and control. Now here's the problem. He is now, little g, the God of this world. He's the God of this world. So this world system screams, king me. Why? Because it operates under his authority. Matter of fact, I alluded to it a while ago, but we see this right now in the campaign season. Is it not sickening? I mean, here's the thing. They devour each other. Democrats are, are devouring other Democrats and Republicans. Other, and then when you put them together, they really do. And what is it? Who's going to be in power? Who's going to get control? And it's ugly, man. It's ugly. But here's the truth. When Jesus came, he flipped the script. He flipped the script. You want power? You want authority? Here's what Jesus said. He said, to become great, serve. To become great, serve. He said, "To to, to be first, go last. He flipped the script, didn't he? You won't hear that out there much. No, no, you go ahead. No, 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 you go ahead. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. That's why after Jesus left and the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit, that's why they accused the disciples of turning the world upside down. Why? Because it's a different world, a different kingdom with different rules. But you know what? 
Jesus' disciples were not turning the world upside down. They were trying to turn it right side up. The world's been upside down for so long. Elisha poured water. That's why he parted water. But who else poured water? Jesus. When he said, at the, we just served communion. When he said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. The first thing he did was stoop down and wash smelly feet. <coughs> smelly feet. Jesus poured water. Elisha poured water. God's asking us to pour water. If we want to part water, we've got to pour water. Are you saying, am I saying, are you saying king me? Are you trying to become king or are you kinging Jesus? In our culture, there's a real claim for fame today. Real claim for fame. A desperation for recognition. What's it look like in our day? Here's what it looks like. How many followers do I have? How many liked my post? And I'm not against that. Hey, I like your post. Okay, I like all of you. All my campuses, I like you. But can I tell you, that's a trap. Because it's like a drug. You can never get enough. And, it, 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 and it's, it's making people sick. Think about it. Think about all the, all the famous people. They're messed up, man. They're messed up. Why? Here's why. Because we were not created for fame. We're not wired for it. We can't handle it. I'll give you an example. Elvis Presley and Michael Jackson. Both great entertainers. I admire both of them. But there was no more bigger fan base than Elvis Presley or Michael Jack, the king of rock and the king of pop. Most famous people on the planet both died lonely and miserable. Elvis Presley, the week before he died, was interviewed. And the interviewer said, how does it feel to be the most loved and famous person on planet Earth? His words were, I am the loneliest, most miserable man on the planet. Why? We're not wired for fame. See, we were created to worship, not be worshipped. We can't handle it. So careful about saying king me, because you may not be able to handle that. Now, let me end with this. Promotion's not wrong, folks. Promotion's not wrong. But it's how we achieve and receive promotion. Are we kinging us, or are we letting God do it? In the Lion King, what was it? Who is going to be king of pride land? Pride is self-promotion. How do we do it right? Here it is. Philippians 2, 5. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death that, at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, because of that submission. Notice this. God lifted him high and honored him. Far beyond anyone or anything ever. So that all beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow and worship before, his, before this Jesus Christ and call out praise that he is master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Jesus is our great example. And see, Jesus, unlike the world, Jesus didn't try to work his way up. He worked his way down, and that's how he received his crown. Here's the thing. God wants to promote us, but he wants to do it the same way he did it in Jesus' life. Notice this, 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown. You understand you're going to get a crown? You will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. And then verse 6, two verses down. Therefore, if you want this crown, here's how you get it. You don't claw and work your way up. You kind of work your way down. Notice this. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you 
in due time. See, folks, if we'll focus on serving and not deserving, king me, king me, and we'll focus on devotion and not promotion, he will exalt us. Let's be like David. Hey, if God wants me on the throne, he'll put me on the throne. If God wants to take me off the throne, he'll take me off the throne. I know that, um, just telling you how it worked in my life. Again, done a lot of things wrong. I'm messed up just like all of you. And you are. <laughs> if you don't know it, talk to people closest to you. They'll tell you. But there were people that was trying to give me advice, kind of like David was getting advice. To go after a certain position. And I knew it wasn't right. I knew it would hurt somebody to get that position. And I told my wife, I said, we're, we're not talking to those people anymore. We're going to stay away. I'm convinced if I'd have let them speak into my life and I would have tried to do what they were telling me to do, I don't think I'd be in ministry today. Why? Because you don't king you. You don't self-promote. God doesn't back that. But if we'll just say, you know what, God? Wherever you want me. If you want me to pastor a church, I'll pastor a church. If you want me to work in the nursery, I'll work in the nursery. Do you know what I started out in ministry? When I got our Teen Challenge, I just so was thankful to Jesus. I just wanted to do whatever he wanted me to do. So the next thing I know, Jennifer's done dragged me into the nursery. Praise God. But you know what? I, I enjoyed it. You know why? Because I was doing it for Jesus. I was doing it for Jesus. I, the pastor would call me sometimes. I'd, I'd work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. And the pastor would call me and say, hey, can you? I remember one time he said, can you drive some of our people down to Atlanta? They want to go on a mission trip and I couldn't find anybody else. Absolutely, I'll do it. And I believe it was doing those things. Remember he said, if you're faithful over another man, he'll give you your own. He was faithful and least to be given much. God's into honor and faithfulness. And if we'll do that, the sky's the limit. The Lion King. Meow. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. <laughs>